Hello and welcome to the Fully Charged Show podcast. Uh, I just want to say that the podcasts are becoming really important for me personally. I am learning so much doing these shows. There's some amazing ones coming up. I really advise you in a strong, supportive and, uh, you know, benign way to subscribe to the Fully Charged Show podcast because there's such brilliant guests on the list coming up and I don't want you to miss them because, you know, my favourite podcasts, I've got them on my podcast app. I have to say it like that because I'm old. I can't just say podcast app like a young person could. And when I say young person, I mean someone under 55. Anyway, uh, you know, they just appear on my podcast app because I've subscribed to them. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to go, ooh, I must remember to download the Fully Charged Show podcast next week or I'll miss it because I would forget to do it. So if, if you subscribe, all that stuff is catered for. You don't have to worry about it. Um, and this week's episode is a classic example of that. Something that I knew very little about and I learned a lot about during the episode. So this week I speak to a delightful man called Stephen Mearsman from a company called Zenobi Energy. Now, you can be forgiven, even if you are interested in electric vehicles and renewable energy, for of not hearing of, uh, not having heard about Zenobi Energy. But they are doing extremely well. They're hiring staff, in case you're looking for a job, and they supply uh, backup power sources for many, many different uh, needs and wants around the world. Electric vehicles, commercial and industrial uh, sites, factories, you know, buildings, offices, all that sort of thing. And utilities and infrastructure. So even you know, like grid level energy storage. They, they supply and manage batteries and it's all it's it's as much to do uh, uh, same with electric cars same with a lot of this stuff it's as much to do with software as is with hardware uh, and they can show enormous cost benefits and cost savings for big companies and uh, uh, you know any uh, uh, utilities people who who distribute electricity because you know, I think most of the listeners of the Fully Charged Show podcast will know now the cost of electricity, particularly in the UK. It's not in all markets. Wouldn't be in uh, France, for instance, which is majority nuclear. But in many markets, the cost, wholesale cost of electricity fluctuates over the day. When there's high demand, it's more expensive. When there's low demand, it's cheaper or free or even in a negative uh, cost setting. And that's what Zenobi have designed their software and their hardware and their way they work with their data to reduce the cost. So you use your battery when electricity is expensive and you fill your battery when electricity is cheap. All that stuff we've been talking about for years, but they're actually doing it in the real world now with huge batteries all over the shippity shop. So... I think this is a really interesting episode. I think you'll learn a lot. Please do subscribe to the Fully Charged Show podcast. I won't go on about it again, but, you know, please do. And just in case you're listening to this when it's only just come out, our survey is still going. The links for that will be um, in the show notes of this episode, uh, along with uh, links to Zenobi's site, because that's worth a look at, because they explain a lot of the stuff they do. Um, that's enough from me. Let's get on with the show. Please welcome Stephen Mearsome from... I've just got to check that I said his name right. No, I didn't. And I'm very embarrassed. Sorry, Stephen. Stephen Mearsman from Zenobi Energy. Enjoy. My Energy is putting the eye back into British innovation. My energy is putting the eye back into inventing the future. My energy is putting the eye back into inspiring a nation. Recharging the world with green smart energy. Charge your EV with your PV and more. Visit myenergy.com and help to spark the green revolution. My energy, driving the charge to a greener future. So, Stephen, thank you for taking the time to talk to us on the Fully Charged Show podcast. I mean, this is what you're doing uh, is the is the thing that I, I think I kind of understood when I spoke to kind of electrical engineers and the National Grid kind of 10 years ago is, you know, how do we 
trans transition from burning coal 24 hours a day or gas 24 or nuclear where we always have a supply of electricity to something that is you know variable uh -huh. at the very least and you know the answer then was well you know one of the answers is batteries mm -hmm. <laughs> but then you know batteries were unimaginably expensive yeah. And there were some electric cars that had batteries and they were unimaginably expensive and they didn't go very far and no one knew how long the batteries would last and no one knew, you know, it was a mystery still. Whereas, and what's happened in that 10 years is transformative. I think there's no other way of doing it. And I mean, I can tell now, and I know very little about what you do, but, you know, clearly Zenobi Energy is doing some serious, big, chunky battery stuff. So I'm yeah. very much relying on you to explain how how you started it how you're doing it what you're doing it with where you're doing it all that stuff is fascinating yeah no first off thanks for the invite I'm really keen to, to talk to you I've, I've seen the show many times it's, it's very exciting to, uh, to to be invited but oh, good. um from from our perspective what we are trying to do at, at, at Sonobi is actually trying to accelerate uh this whole transition and, and we're doing that in a few ways by bringing together different um, exp expertises. So we've got engineers, we've got finance people, we've got software people, and it's by bringing that mix together that you can do exciting things. And, and where we started four years ago with, was with looking at the geographic reality, which is the UK is an island. We're getting out of a lot more renewables. We can't import or export uh, power always to the continent. Like when they could in Germany, they said, oh, we'll build all green stuff. If the wind blows too hard, we'll just give it to France or Belgium. But yeah. for the UK, it's a bit harder. So we saw that there was going to be a need for storage, uh, which is how we started with battery containers and fields similar uh, to what we were talking about just earlier. And um, that's where we started. But then quite quickly, we noticed there's actually not just macro problems. There's also more localized problems where the grid... Uh, is sort of like you said, engineered to take lots of coal from a centralized place and then distribute yeah. it. And now it's moving in lots of different directions. Power can go one way in the morning, another way in the evening. So we need buffer and, and storage plays a key role in that. The other element is that volatility has increased. Uh, so before we had with winter, people used more power, summer people used less. So the worry was how do we store gas for six months in the cheapest way possible. Right. Now it's, oh, we've got a cloud going over the sun. Um, we need yeah. to respond in milliseconds or somebody plugs in an EV. And we sort of started looking at ways for batteries to participate in that. The, what we saw is people are scared of the technology or, or they want a partner to sort of um, take that risk with them and guide them on that journey. So we started putting batteries with large industrial customers to uh, help with brief power interruptions that are becoming so important with uh, all these automated uh, production processes. Yeah. Uh, people who had lots of solar on their roof and were exporting it at, during the day, getting barely anything, and then importing expensive power at night. So we, we, that's what we said as well. Actually, we can put a battery here, help you with that problem, but you don't have to buy it. We'll buy it and will charge you uh, for the service that you need. And the rest of the time when you don't need it, we'll again sell services to national grid, distribution networks, et cetera, so that the battery is always working. Because the analogy I always use, and my colleagues, if they're listening, they'll get annoyed because they've heard this too many times, is <laughs> a battery is a bit like a Swiss pocket knife. Uh, it can do many, many different things. You need to be very careful. You don't just buy an expensive spoon, which is what yes. you do. When you use it for so, yeah. so that's always the trick with these business cases is trying to make sure there's a realm of things to do to get the cost for our customers as low as possible. And, and that's really what dragged us into the EV world was that we were doing these things for industrial customers. And then there's this yeah, future class of large energy users, if you will. And it's, it's EVs, but not yeah. just you and I driving an electric car, but also uh, buses, trucks, and these vehicles do lots of miles, which actually help the business case for electric, because the more yeah. miles you do, the more diesel you save. And um, the challenge is, well, how do you fund it up front? How do you get over that hurdle of investing in the infrastructure, buying that vehicle that costs so much because of the batteries? And that's where we sort of started developing solutions first for the charging by putting small Tesla batteries in, uh, in a, a bus depot near Guildford and Newport right. and other places, uh, combine that with our software, so that you don't need to have an expensive grid upgrade. And if you need to move after a few years, you can take the whole thing with you. So those types of solutions. 
And then quite quickly we saw, well, what's the second biggest challenge with uh, heavy duty EV electrification? And it's uh, the cost of the batteries and the risk that you need to replace them after a few years. Because I mean, you and I, we do, yeah, if we do 50 miles in a week, that might be a lot. But buses and trucks, they do hundreds of miles a day. So yeah. degradation profile is much steeper. So what we said is, well, actually, we'll fund those batteries because we um, can uh, have a use for them when they come off the vehicle. They might still have 80% left, 75% left, something. Right. So we take them from there and we did tests and we proved that you could use them in our stationary applications. And then we go backwards from there to say, well, we can fund those batteries and charge the bus operator or the fleet operator actually only for what they use. So if you lower the cost, then it doesn't just become the sustainable or the green thing to do. It becomes the financially sustainable thing to do right. and uh, a no brainer really. And that, that, that's what we, we, we try to do for our, our customers and partners. Yeah, because that is very interesting then, because that was certainly one of the questions I was going to ask you was about second life batteries effectively. But up to now, I've only, because of all the discussions I've been involved in, I've only really thought about that from the point of view of cars, of individual private, privately yeah. owned vehicles, which, you know, in 10 years time, there'll be Teslas where you could say, well, if we replace the battery, particularly by then, the battery capacity will have increased yet again by an enormous amount. The car yeah. can carry on driving. But, you know, what you're talking about is that kind of the more I, that we've heard about that the less kind of plausible it is because the batteries are last in cars are lasting much longer than anyone expected and certainly the next generation are going to last way beyond the life of the car you know so it's it was one of the challenges for us which is a testament to the technology really one of the challenges for us was when we started trying to get involved in second life is finding enough second life batteries because yeah. they were still in cars driving driving away yes. <laughs> Um, well, that was, I mean, that was one of the things we learned from a battery recycling company we did a show about in Germany. They, they're kind of waiting. They're kind of standing around the factory looking at their watches because there's no, there's no batteries coming. But it's going to take off like a hobby. But seat. it will do, yeah. If you look yeah. on the heavy duty side, I mean, the first bus is sort of, I mean, in China, they've been going at it since the 90s. But if you look at it in, in Europe, I guess the first big adoption was sort of 2016, 2017. Yeah. So I think next next 24 months are going to be we're going to see those numbers increasing quite drastically. Right. And I mean, I don't know at all. I've, we're about to well, very whenever we're allowed to again film some electric buses and the manufacturing of them. But I have no idea how big, what the capacity of a battery is in a bus. It's going to be bigger than a Nissan Leaf, I'm guessing. Yeah, it's about uh, 500 uh, kilowatt hours is what right. you're looking at. So I think a Nissan Leaf is about 30 to 50 or something yeah. like that we typically use. So yeah, it's about. Yeah, factor ten to fifteen. Five hundred kilowatt hours. So that's half. Buses, is that that's half a megawatt hour, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, two buses is a megawatt, which is vast. Right. Right. Um, so if you then look at it, these buses need, or these trucks need to charge in four hours because most of the time they're on the road carrying yeah. buses or people to their destination. So the amount of spikes that generates on the grid is huge. It's got to be. Uh, luckily, it does it at a time when people don't really use power, which is the middle of the night. But yeah. It's still a local bottleneck, and with smart charging software and batteries at the right places, you can solve this bottleneck. And then the right. benefit is that you've got a battery sitting there, which when the buses are out during the day, can sell services to uh, the national grid and, and help with, with uh, right. people charging their cars during the day. So you, you sort of get uh, a double benefit uh, for the ecosystem. Right. But then, okay, so, because that's, I can sort of understand why a bus or, you know, and what the, I think the other thing that's coming very soon is delivery yes. uh, last it's not last mile, it's last 50 mile delivery vehicles, I would suppose. Oh, yeah. You know, that is, I, I've actually started seeing them. It's the most extraordinary thing that I followed a, a vehicle transporter probably last year or early this year on the M5 heading south. Yeah. And it was full of Amazon delivery vans, electric, I think by Mercedes. Ever since then, I've just seen them delivering. So around here, we now get electric deliveries which is a more and more common type, but those are going to be used so much more than private vehicles. So there, there'll be another source. But the, again, when you see that transition where a company has, I don't know what, two, hundreds of vans, you know, thousands in some cases, yeah. and you're charging those at night, you know, that is one, it's a colossal impact on, you know, where do we get, we've got to produce all that power, but also it's a, it's a tremendous benefit because that's, stored power i mean that i suppose that's a slightly different topic the vehicle to grid thing but that certainly yeah. i think will will hit the commercial market way before well, the private one well it's a huge benefit for the, the community as well because i mean those are the vehicles doing the most miles so if you get those to be the cleanest 
Yeah. It, it's it's well, low hanging. I don't know if it's low hanging fruit, but it's definitely the, the segment it's, of the market it's where pretty it's easy. Yeah. biggest impact. Um, yeah. So. But then, so but what I was was kind of getting to is is uh, you know we're getting a better picture. Uh, of of the the lifespan of a battery in a vehicle you know and it, it's, yeah. it is definitely much longer than anyone expected mm-hmm. but i don't i have no idea about the lifespan of say a large uh battery installation a static battery installation in a factory or even a grid supporting mm-hmm. one i don't know what well, how people, they operate. people typically target initially sort of 10 15 years i mean these are infrastructure projects so these are long-term investments so you yeah. need a certain type of um uh, of companies to invest in that, I guess, but obviously they do degrade. So what yeah. people do typically factor in is some sort of a top up uh, midlife. But technically, if you engineer the system right, you can keep swapping battery modules, and then right. yeah, you can keep running almost indefinitely if if if, if, if you if you are. Because there's actually quite a lot of other stuff in one of those big boxes full of batteries that isn't batteries. I mean, the, I guess the battery management system, the software that's running it. Yeah, the software, so, you've got the uh, the inverters, similar to what you would have on a solar panel or right. transformers. And transformers are, yeah, can run for 40 years. Inverters can run for 15, 20 years if you maintain them well. Right. And then the modules, well, with a, a new battery, uh, they might sort of degrade from, say, 100 to 60, 70% over 10, 15 years. Yeah. Now you can then look at, well, what are the services they need to provide? Because right now we use batteries in the UK primarily for their twitchiness, a sort of the ability to put bursts of power very quickly, but very briefly. So the fact that they they degrade in terms of how much energy they can hold is less of a factor. But we start looking uh, to what the future applications will be, the amount of energy, the size of the reservoir, rather than just the sort of the the funnel coming out becomes more important. Right. Like how do we get rid of three hours of excess wind, uh, etc. Like those types of things. And yeah, that degradation will become more important. And I suspect that we will see people starting to augment their batteries and, and top up or take old modules away, put new ones in. Right. The question is again, what do you do with those old modules? So yeah. that's where the uh, comes in again uh, as, a, as an important uh, way to yeah, extract more value, lower the cost, allow more new applications and, and make sure these things don't end up getting recycled. I mean, it's great that these things can be recycled. Yeah, right? but you want to delay that for as long as possible. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So we're then, just helping take the can down the road. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but that's <laughs> quite a good... <laughs> in terms of cans, that's one of the better ones to kick down the road in a way, isn't it? But yeah, exactly. but then, so just so I understand this, this is shows the complete layman uh, level of understanding. But the, if you have a battery that was when it was new 100% and it responded in, incredibly quickly because that's certainly things I've heard, particularly the, 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 the knowledge I have of the big Tesla battery in South Australia. That was yeah. one of the remarkable, it was almost kind of discovered by, by accident what was going on there. But if, if it's then like 10 years later, it's at 60%, can it still deliver what power it has at the same speed? That speed of, of response, isn't, that doesn't slow down. That doesn't, with, change, that doesn't change at all, which is one of the great things right. about, about batteries, which you don't have with yeah, turbines and other things that have moving parts. You keep, yeah. that, you keep that twitchiness. Uh, as a, a, it doesn't lose its twitchiness. Because yeah, exactly. I think when I was 22, I was pretty twitchy. And now, <laughs> I'm definitely not. You know, you've got to tell me five times before I... <laughs> do something <laughs> so i've forgotten yeah no so it's not yes that's but that, so it, so then, it stays like usain bolt but it can't run the marathon anymore right yes <laughs> yeah but then so the capacity i mean that's the the thing that was seems crazy and you just think how can this possibly work you know is that when you under, i sort of i think i've got a level of understanding where i understand the, the kind of quantity and the type of materials in my Tesla battery that yeah. I have here, you know, and it's kind of, it's, it seems like a lot, but mm-hmm. that is a tiny, you know, that is tiny in comparison with the really big grid batteries. Is the actual technology in, I know that Tesla's are, but in, in large grid stale battery, batteries from other companies, other suppliers, yeah. is it exactly the same as in a vehicle or is it sometimes slightly different? It's- I say sometimes it's slightly different. I mean, I think actually the, the typically the, the highest quality stuff tends to go into the vehicles because obviously reliability, road safety, the packaging is slightly different because you need to be, deal with all these aspects. Which yeah. with uh, 18 tons of batteries sitting in a field, you don't need yeah. to worry about acceleration and, and that. No. <laughs> but the, um, the, the 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 concept and the principles are the same. It's just right. scaled up. So if you look at a battery in a car, 
you've got a few modules put together in a pack and that makes up your vehicle battery. Yeah. But if you then look at heavy duty vehicles, you might have a few of those packs. So it sort of keeps scaling yeah. um, with layers and layers on top. And, and with grid, you would have, say, uh, a few of those packs sitting in series in what something called a string. And then you might have six to eight strings forming up a container or, or, or a Tesla mega pack. And then you would have several of these mega packs constituting right. the site. And you then have the battery management system that manages things at the, the cell level, making sure these things are taken care of. That all those different BMSs then communicate with an EMS, an energy management system that says, I want the whole of this thing to do this. And right. if one of the batteries doesn't respond quick enough, it says, oh, uh, battery one, you're being a bit slow. Battery two, you, you, you work a bit harder to compensate, et cetera, right. et cetera. But the architecture is the same. Yeah. And I mean, can you, you, what, at the moment, what is, just because I think people will love hearing this, what is the biggest grid battery that, I mean, not necessarily one you've done, but the biggest one that you know of that's in the world? I still that, think well, one of the biggest, I think is, uh, there's one obviously in Australia uh, with Tesla, with Neowin. Um There's also uh, the ones that are going on in uh, California where they, they outbid a, a peaking plot. Uh, yeah. So those, those are quite big, but... Yeah, you're talking about several hundreds of, uh, of megawatt hours. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, lots of, uh, you'd have to park up lots of cars to... Uh, yes, to, uh, to, to do the equivalent but, of that. Well, what's interesting in, in comparison is if you look at Second Life, uh, the biggest projects, you might have only a few megawatt hours. And the reason for that is we really have to start that industry. But once that kicks off, if you look at all those vehicle batteries, where can they go? Yeah. Um, it's it's a massive opportunity yeah. um, rather than a rather than a liability. So that's what yes. That's what I mean, I think that's probably something that the general public still don't get. You know, we've just had this announcement uh, this week uh, uh, about the you know the twenty thirty stopping of sales of uh, combustion cars, and that it, it's always, when these things happen, we always get this new influx of people who are, you know, a lot of them genuinely interested and positive about it but you get an enormous amount of i think you can call it hostility and yeah. negativity because and then you realize oh that's they don't know about this of course they don't why would why should they you know there's no reason they you know it's something i've been steeped in for the last 10 years and you will have been professionally you know you just know this stuff so you don't, and then you go you have to explain well no you don't throw a battery away <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you, you say that, but it's it's um, at the same time it's still um, it's so new. I mean, if you look at it, we've got um, over a hundred electric buses that we manage for our, right. our operators, and and that's in the UK, is it? That's in the UK. Okay, we've right. got a few in other countries that we can hopefully talk about soon. Um, but the the shocking thing was that I had a customer quoted us say that we were probably yeah twenty twenty five percent of the market, which right. given how we're a relatively young company was a bit of a surprise yes. to us. Yeah. But if you look at how it's accelerating, I really think we've hit that, that sort of that tipping point yeah. where probably by the end of the year, right, we've been in, in, in electric vehicles, I would say, for two years. The company's four years old. And um, in the last uh, six months, I think we've signed up 100 more. So from that perspective, wow. it's, the time to double is, is, is shortening uh, massively, yeah. which is just because there's more vehicles available in the market. People are more comfortable with technology. Yeah. Uh, the whole COVID uh, situation has made people really think hard about air quality and the other yeah. impact it has. Um, and the governments really jumped behind it saying, well, we need to build back better. Sorry to, to rephrase politically. Yes. So I do apologize for that. Yeah. But the, um, whatever you think of that, or, 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 or but yeah. regardless, um, there's really sort of all these things coming together. And, and that's why it's so important that we think about this as an ecosystem. How do all the different stakeholders need to come together? Yeah, Local yeah. city councils, knowing that they have options, that they don't just have to pay everything up front and that it's going to be hard and difficult. And, not, and, and frankly, I mean, obviously, a big fan of electric and big fan of battery electric, but you sort of see sometimes the lobbies for hydrogen and electric slinging mud at each other, which is really unfortunate because yeah. the last thing you want is to terrify people and have them say, oh, the debate's not settled. It's VHS versus beta yeah. electric. Yeah. Let's just buy another diesel. So, yeah. so, so I do think sh shows like this and, and, and other forums have a really important role to play in getting that knowledge out there, pricking through these myths, etc., yeah. so that people do feel comfortable uh, taking the leap and, and know that there's partners there to help them. Yeah, no, I mean it is a it is a very long and sometimes quite exhausting <laughs> process. 
there are days when I just hang my head. Just go, I can't carry on. But it's very, but it's also well, very I'll exciting. I'll of an acting buses to cheer you up on those days. <laughs> yeah, and that, yes, exactly. And I mean, it's certainly an aspect that I hadn't really considered that you could take the battery out of a bus and put it in a box and put it next to a hospital, a building, a factory, an office. Yeah. You know, that is a chunky... Well, yeah stuff. it's chunky but it does require some work it requires sure, software. Yeah. And one of the important things is like similar to uh, your car if you try to resell it no people will ask well what's the maintenance history how many issues has it, has it got and that's why yeah. the software layer is so important like we control the charging in such a way that we don't damage the batteries and we got the best possible battery at the end of the line yeah we've got telematics on the vehicle which sucks out the data and tells us everything that's going on with the battery so we can steer in real time and manage the degradation and i think it's that data layer that really enables this because then you can say well actually i've got a digital copy of this battery entire life right so you yeah. know exactly what you're getting when you put it in the second life and if you see things happen you can then start and correlate and work out what's going on yeah. control that then with software to to counteract etc uh, etc et so right. it's uh, I, I think it's it's been until now you didn't have all these different things sort of converging together yeah uh, to, 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 to make this possible yes I mean I think that's probably the, the the bit that's the hard thing to get if you're at completely outside this world is that that in, a, in effect the the equally important aspects of what the whole thing is the financial uh, structures that you are able to create with it the software which people don't think about. You just think of it as a battery and it's got two wires that go off that make something work. And there's a huge amount of computing and software between those two. And then the actual hardware, the actual batteries, you yeah, know, which is the, the, in a way the user, simplest bit. And the user behavior, because I mean, one yeah. of the things that we learned a lot was that I'd never, I'd never been in a bus depot up until a few years ago, but they're fascinating yeah. things at night because there's so much activity. activity. It's, it's it basically, they're playing Tetris with 18 ton buses, right? Right. Um, trying to fit these all in into the depot, get them, and then in that thing, we're suddenly saying, "Oh, we need to get that bus to a charger within X minutes to make yeah. sure it's to charge the next morning." While before, uh, they just tank it up, and it would have yeah. enough fuel for two days. I mean, it's a massive shift. At the same time, you've then got the CFO of the company saying, "Well, this bus costs twice the amount, and it generates, this, it carries the same amount of people." Yeah. So we're talking about a huge change for the whole organization. So. It's really a role of yeah, small companies such as ourselves, the big energy companies, et cetera, to sort of come together with these people and say, hey, there are solutions. We, yes, we can, we can deal with these different aspects. And what we sort of jumped in is that we've taken the overall responsibility on and said, look, we'll tie it all together so that right. if something goes wrong, you only need to point at one person uh, yeah. and it's us. And, and, yes. <laughs> and we'll put our money where our mouth is. If uh, we don't charge the bus, uh, we pay for a replacement bus for the day. Right. Yeah, because we 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 yeah we want we need to back ourselves to a degree and 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 and, and prove that we can uh, we, we can do it. Because I mean, there's got to be huge costs. You know, there's enormous cost savings with a private vehicle. You know, and, yeah. and in terms of fuel costs and maintenance costs. But yeah. I would imagine with a bus, you know, if you run a bus all day on a diesel engine, it doesn't matter how hybrid and how many green leaves you paint on the back of the bus. It's using a lot of fuel it's got to be i don't know how many miles to the gallon they do right, typical bus in london and typical bus in london does at least 130 miles so you can of, you can of driving a day yeah of driving a day so you can do the math on that and the, the thing is with electric is that it's rightly as you point out it's 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 more uh, fuel efficient so it's yeah. a huge saving and, and good for the environment so the, the, it shows the two can go hand in hand on the maintenance side i mean there's statistics from mostly from asia because they've got right. bigger fleets running there or from from the nordics as well Electric buses break down about uh, three to six times less than diesel. Right. right. So uh, that's a wow, huge. That I mean, if you look at a typical vehicle, a, a bus or a truck needs to survive for about fifteen years yeah. or longer in some places. Um, yeah, that that adds up. Yes. I mean, it's a common sight when I used to live in London and cycle every day all over London. A common sight was a bus stopped on the side of the road with a with a, one of the seats leaning up against the back, which was the signal that it had broken down. And that wasn't rare. That was a very common. And those were definitely we're talking a long time ago. They were all diesel buses. I mean, that is I think the two things that people 
forget is how, I mean, I've forgotten now because I haven't driven one so long, but how unreliable internal combustion engines are, how many tiny little things can go wrong with them. Perfectly decent vehicles that have been well looked after. Yeah, I'm a mechanical engineer, so I'm inherently suspicious of anything with moving parts. Exactly. And, Loads and, of moving parts. Yeah, yeah exactly. And then with yeah. electric, you've got less components, yeah. and, and they're all more reliable because they don't move. So yeah, from, from yeah. that perspective, it is. But it's also, I mean, I think the other one is, which I didn't know about until I sort of looked into it in more detail and, the, you know, Nash, certainly it was National Grid Engineers that first highlighted it. And then I spoke to some other people who work in the power sector. If a coal plant goes, well, it, it doesn't go wrong when they have to service it. They don't turn it off for the afternoon, give something a polish, <laughs> give it a bit yeah. of a, it's months it's offline, literally yeah. months at a time. And we never hear that. You never hear about that. You know, you hear about the reliability of wind turbines. They're, they're, they produce per, per megawatt hour, they're so much more reliable than a gas. And it's more modular. If you power. have one turbine going down, it doesn't necessarily affect yeah, the whole stop wind them all. Yeah. Same with I mean, the service we're trying to offer to people is say, look, we, we plan in redundancies, we right. manage all the software, we've got people constantly monitoring it. Uh, and, and we have redundancies in our fleet as well, where we could potentially move things around if, if, if something were to go wrong. Um, again, based on the experience uh, that, that we've, we've, we've sort of built up in, in, in the sector. Yeah. And it comes again, data, 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 because if yes. you've got the data in real time, then you know how to mitigate in real time. It's not like you wander in in the morning and suddenly say, oh, they're not full. Yes. Uh, no, you know the moment something goes down, you can dispatch an engineer and say, oh, fix right. this, do that, try this, uh, etc." cetera. So, yeah. So, yeah, and then, so then the, surely the other advantage, which I presume your clients would be able to understand fairly quickly, is if you can store a lot of electricity, the one thing that the, I think that's the other thing that electric vehicle owners become aware of, and I wasn't aware of it before, is the fluctuating price of electricity on the grid. I had no idea. I thought it cost 15p a kilowatt hour all the time, because that's what we pay. We don't know, or 18p or whatever it is you pay. And yeah. then you find out, oh, my God, there's sometimes where it's massively more expensive than that. So, you know, and then there's a lot there's of time. You get paid. Yeah. But yeah. there's a lot of time when it's massively less and now negative. I mean, I think the, the fact that it's gone negative numerous times this year is a new phenomenon, which is very much down to renewables. But and, you know, there are there's a wonderful man who I, I haven't managed to do it yet. So I'm on, on a very uh, unagile tariff here. But, you know, a guy who drove, basically drove his Tesla from Milton Keynes to Scotland and it, and it cost him £8.50. I, he was paid £8.50 nice. to put that electricity in his car, which yeah. is bonkers. You know, when you try and explain that to people. Uh, but, but that's again a big change even for like national grid and the network operators to go from an environment where the worry is not about how we have enough capacity. It's more about having the right power at the right time. At the right time, yeah. Or the ability to take power on and off the system at the right time. Because when prices go negative, it's basically there's too much generation. They can't export it to France, yeah. Belgium, or the Netherlands quickly enough. So they're paying people to, to switch off. Yeah. But it's, again, unless you have the data, like you said, you can't change your behavior. Yeah. But then presumably, you, if you've got an enormous amount of storage capacity in various locations you can go well, we'll have some of that <laughs> yeah, can, you, exactly. can you give us a couple of megawatt hours how much is how much do you pay us to have it i mean that is it and then you can sell it the following day when the prices have gone through the roof because it's not windy and it's dark and yeah it's, you often it's, don't have to wait that long I think. no i'm like sure said, it's yeah. all about twitchiness again i mean in, in this yeah. country prices sort of vary on a half hour basis in yeah. Uh, Germany is every 15 minutes in Australia it's every five minutes wow um, and then in those intervals they also still need to deal with shortfalls and shocks and that's where these these words like grid services and balancing and right. frequency response and, and, and those get banded about it's to deal with the shocks yeah with the short uh, the short the short intervals because I think when I first sort of thought about this a few years ago I assumed you know that one day in a mythical future we'd have sort of five million terawatt hour batteries that would mean that we could run the whole country for the for months with no wind or sun and actually that isn't really ever the uh, now i understand that's never the aim it's all about that that little those little fluctuations all the time yeah at the risk of um the other analogy um that's very mechanical so if you look at plumbing right and, and, yeah. and at home you've got your water boiler yes yeah you can have some of these smart thin boilers that heat up the water as it goes to your shower but a lot of people will actually have sort of a, a vast a big tank. That, yeah 
that keeps the water hot. And, and the reason for that is that you, do, you use it very intermittently. With electricity, yes, we use it constantly, but there are peaks and troughs similar yeah, yeah. with our transport system. And what, what storage or, or flexibility in the system allows you to do is to sort of make sure that you make your investments on the average of what's required yeah. and the storage will take care of the peaks. While yeah. before with plumbing and um, electricity, the paradigm was, oh, we need to make sure that the wires are thick enough to handle the biggest possible peak. Now that's right. expensive. Yeah. Particularly if demand is growing, which, which it will hopefully be the, the next couple of years as a result yeah. of the edification. So that's why we need to find better solutions that are, that are more cost effective. And, and yeah. I think stores, it's going to touch on so many sectors. It's energy and transport merging, uh, electric heating. We see all these sort of different industries coming together, which again yeah. presents real opportunities for consumers to save money, producers to come up with new business models. And then, yeah, hopefully some people like us running around in the middle. to title. Yes. <laughs> but it's, I think it's the other one that is, is a, an easy one. Whenever I've explained this to people, they, I can see that this is people outside the kind of electric vehicle bubble. But the, you know, the, the, the thought when you hear, oh, we're going to put in loads of fast chargers, they just go, well, that's going to, we will need more power stations and more wires and all that. And then you, the first one I saw was at South Mims on the M25 in the UK yes. with some Tesla power packs behind a fence that were yeah. feeding into. So they were, I mean, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of that is they're sort of charging at not a massive rate all the time and then a car comes and plugs in and it can dump power into that car faster because it's got that capacity yep. but you're not immediately putting a strain on the local grid because no, no no what will happen is you'll have a few cars coming up similar to what will happen on, on on our bus depots you'll have a few cars lining up they take as much from the grid as is possible and then the point in time where you plug in that last vehicle that would kick it over or, or like the straw that would break the camel's right. back that's where the battery comes in and says, right. no, no, I'll deal with that. And then usually before the battery runs out, well, you model it, right? You do yeah. studies and simulations and you make sure that it has enough energy in it so that by the time that straw is taken back off again, uh, the battery sort of running on its last leg right. and then you go back to grid supply. So yeah. the answer is not, oh, uh, when you charge off the battery, you're not taking it off the grid. The answer right. is you're taking it from both. From both, yeah. Um, but you're, I mean, yeah, I suppose you can lessen the immediate impact that's on the grid yeah which is these batteries respond in milliseconds so that's because yeah. um, yeah. that was one of the wonderful stories i remember hearing from australia when that was when that uh it would have been a couple of years after the, the big south australia yeah. battery was installed was there was a, a a coal plant flipped its fuse or whatever they do yeah. massive they, they do it, go down for silly reasons usually yeah yes <laughs> but it went down and they were and normally that would have caused a rolling blackout across australia or certainly in browner and it they, it didn't do anything and it was like later the engineers were going well what happened i mean it definitely went off and then they looked and they saw that that battery kicked in in like a thousandth there was a and dumped massive amount of power into the grid just for a, a short time which covered the gap which was extraordinary and they, and they said they didn't know it would do it you know. Some of the services that we're now providing to, to National Grid, etc., we actually have to slow the batteries down. <laughs> well, they respond too fast. Yeah, I mean, obviously, because it's important, right? Because, I mean, National Grid, they, they sort of have the, uh, they're orchestrating the responses, right? So they've got people who can re react slow, but can last very long. The pumped yeah. hydros, they've got the CCDPs, etc. And then the batteries are sitting there as the fast response. And it's a bit like if you've got a child on a swing, if you let it start swinging really hard, it becomes harder to stop it. So right. again, the batteries are the twitchy response where, where the, the, the swing just about starts to get, go out of control. They give it a quick nudge to keep it back within normal limits. Right. If you, obviously, the few times where it goes deeply out of control, you still need the people who can react longer and faster, or you start sending signals with demand response to people to say, hey, we're we going to pay you a little bit to charge your car a right. bit slower. Uh, etc etc because i mean for you if you're charging your electric car if it lasts 15 seconds longer uh to help with a grid emergency you don't really notice that yeah yeah it doesn't change your enjoyability of that car but yeah. it makes massive differences on the grid and it's, it's again with software and data that we can make all these things come together in a way where you don't lose service national grid doesn't lose service yeah. and everybody uh, moves into a cleaner and, and cheaper world which yeah. uh, yeah. I mean, I think that is because that, I sort of started using that just because I wanted to. And then I realized it was actually true, which is cleaner and cheaper. You know, the fact that those two things go together is, yeah. a, I think, a really critical 
a critically important message in a way that and that what you're doing is helping increase the amount of cleaner and cheaper rather than rather than sort of you know saying oh we need more gas so we can charge our batteries i think some people might think that but that isn't really the point I mean, no, and, and you see the industry has gotten onto that uh, very much so i mean people always sort of like you said sometimes they complain about all oh, the buses and this and because it's a red bus and you you hear the diesel engine but yeah actually the sector is doing massive things to uh, lead the way in terms yeah. of uh, of cleaning up uh, our, our cities um because it's it's what they want to do, right? Yeah. And also it makes financial sense for them. So yeah. I, I do think that there's a, there's a huge opportunity and, and, and we're just hoping to uh, accelerate that story by making it so cheap that it will become irrational. So it becomes, a, to use, yeah, to use another awful cliche, it becomes a no brainer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a good one. Or even a no brainer going forward, we could say that. So, but what, what, I mean, where do you see, let's say, because let's go five years ahead, might go 10 years ahead. You know, do, what impacts do you see, or what are there new technologies developing or new battery chemistries that are coming up that you're going, well, this is going to be amazing if we can do this, or we might be able to do that in the future? I mean, is, there, is that. Yeah. I, think, I think there's a lot of uh, things you, that we'll see in the next five years is about people using the technologies we have already and, and putting them together in ways that we didn't expect. Yeah. And for instance, look at our company. We started with large grade scale batteries and now we've sort of got this ecosystem where batteries go in the buses, then to stationary and et cetera, et cetera. I suspect you'll see more of, of those models popping up where people are combining existing technologies in different ways that we right. didn't foresee. Um, I think uh, batteries will continue to, 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 to get cheaper as they are now. I mean, we do see the rates sort of slightly slowing down as, as you would expect, as we've seen with solar. Um, we do see at some point there's no point in adding more density because who drives a thousand miles with their car yeah, right? exactly there's, yeah there's these sort of limits that we're, we're going to run into so i think it's really going to be on the application side and how do people combine it um and and, and democratizing it where the the cost has gotten cheap enough that actually yes it does make sense to have a battery in your attic and yeah. some solar panels on the roof um or it does make sense to have a bat i mean we're now uh, putting mobile battery, second life vehicle batteries in mobile units similar to, similar to diesel uh, gen sets All right. and, and replacing that in, 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 well, there's not a lot of film and events going on at the moment, but yes. in the production sector still and using that to replace um, uh, diesel. And we're yeah. not doing that because, well, it is because people want to go green, but we don't need to necessarily charge much of a premium compared to the existing product. And, right. and that's amazing. I mean, when I first got into batteries, which was 2008 uh, at AES uh, in the US, that would have been nowhere near um, right. cost where parity. we thought we would yeah. be uh, because yeah. the cost then was so different and the software and the technology hadn't quite caught up yet with, yeah. uh, with that. So I see massive democratization of the technology, um, new applications, and um, yeah, I think People underestimate how quickly it'll go, yeah. is, 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 is my view. I mean, I think we've really seen sort of a tipping point in the economics, um, yeah, say between now and the next uh, the next five years, definitely. Because, I mean, yes, the, I mean, it's very obvious the price of batteries has come down. Has, and, and But you think, I mean, I, I from what I can judge of the, the graphs I've seen, it feels like it's sort of, yeah, it's leveling off. It, it, but it has been a, a remarkable drop in price. It's same as solar and, and same as wind in many ways. It's those three things, they've yeah, all got the cheaper. Con- and the power controls have gotten better and cheaper as well, right. allowing you to do things that, I mean, at some, I mean, for instance, with some of the um, applications we're doing now, we're almost more limited by the, uh, the strength, the quickness of the 4G card in terms of how quickly we can respond rather than with right. any actual switching going on in the battery. So you've got 5G coming as well. So it's, it's quite amazing to be in this space now where all these yeah. sort of technologies are coming from all sides and every day you sort of almost feel like you're taking you're doing another rung on the ladder or, or, or taking another step on the stage. Well, I really hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I just want to apologize again to Stephen for mispronouncing his name in my introduction. <laughs> I thought, should I cut that out? And I thought, no, let's reveal the incompetence of the old fella uh, and be transparent. Don't try and get all slick and corporate going forward for the consumer. 
Anyway, I thought that was a fascinating uh, conversation with Stephen. I'm really grateful for him uh, taking the time to it. Please do uh, stick with us. I'm not even going to use the S word. Uh, tell your friends and family, by all means, and have a look at uh, the um, Patreon support page that is help, what helps keeping this show afloat. Uh, lots of fabulous episodes coming up soon, but that's all for now. As always, if you have been, thank you for listening. Thank you.